Amen. This is God's word. Well, congregation, patient in providence and safe in Christ. Patient in providence. Christian life is a life of perseverance by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. Through ups and downs, through joys and trials, we trust God's word and not our own feelings. And we can say as Christians, when all around my soul gives way, then Christ is all my hope and stay. You know what never changes? Christ. Even when everything around us is changing, we trust not our circumstances, but the report of the Lord. We trust God's word. And we say, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You see, God's word stands firm, and in him we trust. Christ is our firm foundation, and in him we are safe and secure. And so, we live by faith in Christ, and we trust his promises, listen, even when we don't see the immediate fulfillment, right? When God promises us something, doesn't mean that it's immediately fulfilled and we enjoy the fulfillment thereof. But what do we do? As we wait, we trust him. We're patient because God's promises are true. And nothing and no one will be able to thwart God's purposes. His word will never fail. And you know, Christians, one day... Even though right now we walk by faith, one day we will see Jesus face to face. But until then, we're called to be patient. We're called to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. James 5 verse 8 says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Lord is coming back. Therefore, be patient. Establish your hearts. Wait upon the Lord. Live in light of the second coming of Christ. As we come to chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, we know that David has been anointed by Samuel, right? It was back in chapter 16. We know that David received a promise that he was going to be Israel's next king. But... Right now, in 1 Samuel 24, David is still on the run. Instead of being honored as Israel's next king, he is chased. He is pursued by his enemies. And of all the people, his own father-in-law, Saul, is after him to kill him, to destroy him. But wait a minute. David received the promise that he was going to be king. And he is hiding in the wilderness. He is seeking refuge. David finds himself in difficult and desperate circumstances and many trials. He seems to be helpless and hopeless. But David's hope is in the Lord. And his help comes from the Lord. David is not alone. The Lord is with him. And so how should David respond to the trials that he's experiencing patience patience because the fulfillment of the promise is coming right now david is humiliated he is suffering but the glory is coming exaltation is coming he needs to be patient and we have so much to learn from god's word today as we Look at chapter 24 ourselves. You see, we saw in, uh, in the previous chapter, last Lord's Day, how David's own people, the people of Keilah, whom David saved from the Philistines, and then the people of Ziph were ready to deliver David into uh, King Saul's hand. 
And we saw at the end of chapter 23 how Saul and his men surrounded David and David's men, and they were about to take them. But at that critical moment, the Philistines invaded the land, and Saul had to return from pursuing after David. And so the Lord in his providence protected and rescued his servant, his anointed one, from the wicked king Saul. And at this point, it would have been easy for David to get frustrated, right? Like, what in the world? He, he would have been, it's, it would have been easy for him to be impatient. It would have been easy for him to want to take things into his own hands instead of waiting upon the Lord. But we see in this chapter that by God's grace, David is patiently waiting for the Lord's timing, right? He, he, he meets Saul. Saul is in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. David could have killed Saul. Human wisdom would tell David to kill his enemy and take the kingdom by his own effort. But David, instead of leaning upon his own understanding, trusts in the Lord and waits upon him. There's so much here for us to learn from how to live as Christians in this world. God calls us to live with patient endurance. You hear that? Patient endurance, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because we know, congregation, life on this side of glory is hard, isn't it? Life is hard. And sometimes we feel lonely and abandoned and discouraged and sorrowful, and we cry out, How long will thou forget me, O Lord? How long? But in those times, we need to be patient and look to God's word and say with the psalmist, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You know, even in the difficult moments of your life, when it's hard to be patient, watch this. You're not going to hell. If you're a Christian, you are saved from the wrath which is to come. So even in the worst of times, you can say, Lord, you have dealt bountifully with me. You have dealt mercifully with me. And therefore, help me to be patient. Help me to wait upon you. Take heart, Christians. Take heart. Take heart. Glory is coming, right? But watch this, the path to glory is paved with suffering. The way you get to glory is through suffering. So be patient in suffering because one day our suffering will end. One day the Lord will wipe every tear from our eyes. So we can trust his providence and we can rest in his care For us, wait on the Lord. The theme of our sermon then is this. God calls you this morning from his word. God calls you to be patient and wait on him because you are safe in Christ and nothing can separate you from his love. God calls you to be patient. He calls you to wait upon him because you are safe in Christ and nothing can separate you from from his love, patient in providence and safe in Christ. As we consider this theme of being uh, patient in providence because we're safe in Christ, we'll see with God's help five encouragements in our sermon text, five exhortations to wait well. We need to wait well, right? Because if Along our pilgrimage, we're kicking and screaming and we're grumbling and murmuring like the children of Israel in the desert. That's not waiting well. I mean, is it waiting well when we're murmuring and complaining all the time? No, God God wants us to wait well. And here we find five encouragements, five exhortations to wait on the Lord. And those will be our five points. So our first encouragement then to be patient in providence is this. Here's our first heading. Don't take matters into your own hands, right? 
Nothing new, nothing that you never heard before, but we need to be reminded from God's word of that which is true because we forget, right? We know we shouldn't take matters in our own hands. We should be trusting the Lord. But how many times we're tempted to do it our way? How many times when we're getting impatient, we rely on our own wisdom instead of running to the Lord? And so don't take matters into your own hands. This is our first exhortation, first encouragement to wait well. Well, what's going on here as we begin this chapter? David is still on the run. He's in the wilderness of En Gedi. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, and it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Verse 2, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So we see here how Saul resumes his pursuit after David, right? Remember, Saul almost got him. And right at that critical moment, he heard the news in the previous chapter that the Philistines had invaded the land. So Saul had to go back from pursuing David. But now, after he has dealt with the Philistines, he's after David again. And he takes with him how many men? Look at verse 2. 3,000 men to get David and destroy him. Verse 3. And he came to the sheep coats. That's shelters for sheep. By the way, where was a cave? So Saul arrives there with his men, and there was a cave And verse 3 says, And Saul went in to cover his feet. Here's what he didn't know. David and his men were there. They remained in the sides of the cave. Now children, adults, in verse 3 we find this Hebrew idiom. Uh, Saul went went in to cover his feet. And that is an idiom for using the restroom. He was relieving himself. He went in the cave. What he didn't know was that David and his men were there, present, Now, in verse 4, we see that David's men are excited. They're like, there couldn't be a better opportunity, David. Here's your enemy. Finish him off. What are you waiting for, right? They say in verse 4, the men of David, Behold the day of which the Lord hath said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall see good unto thee. Here's the perfect opportunity, David. What are you waiting for? Kill your enemy, and then the kingdom will be yours. God has already told you you're going to be the next king. What are you waiting for? Get rid of Saul, and you will have what you were promised. David's men wanted David to take the shortcut to the kingdom, right? Get rid of Saul, kill Saul. But David refuses to take matters into his own hands. David knew that if God had promised, listen, God would fulfill, right? Right? If God promises something, we don't have to remind him again and again, remember God what you promised, he would fulfill. We need to wait and be patient. And like David, you too, congregation, Don't try to rush things according to your own wisdom. Be patient in providence. Don't seek revenge. Don't try to get back at people who wronged you or treated you unjustly. Like David, be patient. The Lord is on your side. We all have people in our own lives who have wronged us, right? We have people in our lives who have spoken ill of us, who have slandered us uh, behind our backs. We all have been hurt by someone, and it's so easy to want to be the judge. It's so easy to want to settle matters in our own wisdom and vindicate ourselves through our own efforts. But God's Word calls us to be patient. Listen to Romans 12. God's word says, be not wise in your own conceits, conceits, recompense to no man evil for evil. Do you hear that? If someone does evil to you, don't try to give them back what they deserve. 
Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Now watch this. Dearly beloved, this is uh, verse 19 of Romans 12. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Vengeance belongs to who? Not to us, but to the Lord, right? Isn't that what it says? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, now this is hard to do, but listen. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with what? Good. Overcome evil with good. As Christians, we don't seek revenge with our personal enemies. We don't hold on to grudges or hurts because we know the judge of the universe. We know that he's perfect, that he's righteous, and he will do perfect justice. And he happens to be our father in heaven because of Jesus. We can wait, right? We can be patient. It's hard, but we can by the grace of God. One day, Christ will vindicate all his people. One day, Christ will judge the living and the dead. So be patient because Christ is your advocate. Christ is your advocate. He says in Matthew 5, verse 44, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I know it. This is hard. In fact, this is impossible for us to do in our own strength, right? This is why we need the gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only by the grace of God can we live like this. David's men used their sinful wisdom to provoke David to take matters into his own hands. But Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now listen, congregation, before we move on. Just like David here was tempted in the wilderness by his men to sin against the Lord by killing Saul, our Lord Jesus, David's son, and David's Lord was also tempted in the wilderness. Our Lord Jesus had the promise that he would inherit, listen, all the nations, right? Psalm 2. Jesus would inherit all the nations as his inheritance. Jesus had that promise. But what does the devil say to him in the wilderness? The devil says, I will give you all of these kingdoms, all the wealth. I'll give you. All you got to do is worship me. You know what David, the devil was telling Jesus to do? Forget the cross. Forget the suffering. Just bypass the cross, and I'll give you immediate fulfillment, immediate pleasure. All you need to do is worship me. And our faithful Savior said, No, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus was patient in providence, and he remained faithful to the end. We need to wait for God's perfect timing as well, instead of trying to rush things, right? And while we're waiting, we need to obey God and trust him. And this brings us to our second encouragement, our second exhortation to wait well. Obey God and wait for his timing. 
Obey God and wait for his timing. The first encouragement was, don't take matters into your own hands. Secondly, second heading, obey God and wait for his timing. Now listen to this. Waiting on the Lord doesn't mean be passive. When, when the Bible says, wait upon the Lord, be patient. It's not saying be passive, just sit back and don't do anything. No, no. To wait on the Lord means to actively persevere by faith in Christ. To wait on the Lord means to, as you're waiting, be faithful, obey God, pray, and do not lose heart, right? Pray, attend to the ministry of the word of God. While you're waiting, be faithful. Be faithful in whatever situation you find yourself in. Obey the Lord by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here on, at the end of verse 4, after he was kind of provoked by his men to go and finish uh, Saul off, notice what David does at the end of verse 4. And David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And then verse 5 says, And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So even though David does not kill Saul and David spares Saul's life, he still kind of sneaks up on Saul and cuts off part of his robe. And after he did that, what does the text say? His heart smote him, right? What does that mean, children? It means that he was convicted. His conscience troubled him. Now, what's going on here? David didn't kill Saul. He just cut off a part of his garment. But his conscience smote him. He was convicted. Here's what's going on. Remember, children, back in chapter 15, after Samuel told Saul that God has rejected him from being king, you know what Saul did? Saul laid hold of Samuel's cloak, and what happened? It tore. Remember that? What was Saul doing? Saul was responding with unbelief and rebellion instead of humility and obedience. Taking uh, the tearing of the garment symbolizes wanting to grasp and hold on to the kingdom. And so what David does here, even though he doesn't kill Saul, he still kind of tears part of his garment the way Saul did to Samuel back in chapter 15. And so David unlike Saul being a true believer, realized that even his harmless action of cutting off Saul's skirt was not appropriate, right? David needed to wait on the Lord to exalt him instead of trying to exalt himself and get to the throne by his own wisdom. Does that make sense? David had a tender conscience. Oh, how much we need to have a conscience like David's. A tender conscience, a conscience that is informed by the word of God, a conscience that is sensitive to the voice of God. We need that, children and adults. Just as David's heart smote him, we need to have such a tender conscience that is so sensitive to and informed by the word of God that even the little bit of sin that we're happy to justify bothers us, right? Because we live in a culture where we're constantly exposed to temptations. And if we're not careful, watch this, it's easy to become desensitized to sin so that we don't notice the things that we noticed before. And it's not a big deal anymore to us. Watch out and be very careful. Keep making your conscience well informed by the word of God so that even the littlest of sin bothers you. And you don't want anything to do with it because even the smallest of sins is what put your Lord on the cross. And you don't want to play with sins, but you want to honor the Lord. 
That's why we need to fill our minds and our hearts with the word of God. Romans 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So David here shows humility And he obeys the Lord, and he waits for his timing instead of making things happen in David's own timing. You see, congregation, sometimes God's timing seems slow, doesn't it? Sometimes we would love for God to hurry up. And it seems like, why is it taking this long? But remember in those times, you are creatures, and the Lord is God. He knows better than you right? Trust him. Not only are we need to do Christ's will, but we need to do Christ's will Christ's way. You see, God's will was for David to be the next king, correct? But David needed to get there God's way, not his own way. What was the sinful way of getting to the throne? Just kill Saul. God's way seems harder, and God's way is harder at times because we would love to have instant gratification, instant fulfillment of the promises God has given us. But you know what God does? He lets us persevere. He even brings us through suffering so that we become less like us and more like Jesus. As we go through suffering, the Lord uses those trials to draw us closer to him. And that is for our good. We can trust him. Parents, you know, your kid says, mom, can I have the cookie? I just brushed my teeth. It's time for me to go to bed. Can I have the cookie? Mom says, no, just wait. Maybe tomorrow. I'll let you know when it's right time. But no, can I have it now? I really feel like eating the cookie now. But the mama says, please wait. And for the kid, it doesn't seem pleasant to wait. Because in the kid's wisdom, the right thing to do is to eat the cookie now. But mama knows better, right? How much more, infinitely more, God knows better than we know what is good for us. We need to trust him. His timing is the best timing. Amen? Now, I know it's hard. Not saying it's easy. But God's timing is the best timing. We can trust him even when we would like the circumstances to be different. Trust God's promises, not your circumstances. So wait on the Lord, and while you're waiting, keep obeying him. Keep being faithful. Keep persevering in prayer. And do not lose heart. Your God is not a dead God like the Hindus worship, right? Your God is the living God. He will take care of you. Be faithful as you wait. There's so many Verses in the Bible that calls us to wait upon the Lord. Let me just share just a few, very few. Psalm 24, verse 17 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 130 says, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Do you hear that? As I wait for the Lord, what am I doing? I'm putting my hope where? In his word. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. David wrote Psalm 63 during this time that he was hiding in desolate places in the wilderness as his enemies were seeking to kill him. And David says in verse 1 of Psalm 63, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. What made David patient in providence? 
knowing God savingly through Jesus Christ. Shouldn't that make us patient as well? We know him. We know the one who said, let there be light and there was light. We know him. We don't just know about him. We know him, right? David knew that he was safe in the Lord. And so in verse 3, David says, Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. What a great verse. Did you know that congregation? The loving kindness of the Lord is better than life. Shouldn't that cause us to be patient in suffering? You see, David had to be humiliated before he would be exalted, right? This chapter and David's own suffering and humiliation points us to the humiliation and exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because David is a picture of Christ, and David points us to his greater son and his Lord, who humbled himself and came into this world in humiliation. But what happened after Christ's humiliation? What happened? His exaltation, right? So watch this. Here's the pattern. First, the cross, then the crown. First, suffering, then glory. This is what the Old Testament is about. The suffering and the glory of the Messiah. First, the cross, then the crown. Like David, his greater son and his Lord, Jesus also had the promise from God, not just to be the king over Israel, but watch this, to be king over all the nations, right? Jesus had that promise. But in order for Jesus to inherit all the nations as the God-man, as the Messiah, Jesus had to go through suffering. In order for Christ to get to the crown, he had to go through the cross And aren't you thankful that Jesus went to the cross? Aren't you thankful that Jesus did not take a shortcut, but he suffered for us? Even the suffering and the humiliation of the cross for us and for our salvation. Philippians 2 says, and as I read these verses, listen to the theme of the humiliation of Christ, and then his exaltation. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly, what? Exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and in things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now watch this. We follow our Lord Jesus as Christians, right? Right? And our lives as Christians, listen, children, adults, listen to this. Our lives as Christians are also patterned after this reality. The pattern of the life of Jesus is also the pattern of our lives upon this earth. First suffering, then glory. First the cross, then the crown. And so trust Christ and look to him as you suffer because one day glory is coming for you if you are a Christian. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You hear that? The sufferings of this present time, whatever you're suffering, going through, and these are real sufferings, real pain, real trials. And God is with you through those trials because he's the God of all comfort. But when you compare those sufferings with the glory that will be revealed in you, no comparison. 
They're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you who are united to Christ by faith. One day, he will raise you unto imperishable and incorruptible glory. And having that promise, now be patient. Now persevere by faith in Christ. 1 Peter 5 says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And what's going to happen? That he may what? Exalt you in due time. Do you see that pattern? Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand and in due time. It's not our timing, but in the right time, God's timing, he may exalt you, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And this brings us to our third exhortation, third encouragement to wait well and live with, live with patient endurance. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord. This is our third heading. Notice the humility David shows in this passage as he is trusting in the Lord, as he is waiting on the Lord. Look at verse 6. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. What is David saying? The Lord will take care of Saul, right? The Lord will judge Saul, not me. He is still the Lord's anointed. He is still king. The Lord will take care of him, and the Lord will take care of me. I will trust him and not take matters into my own hands. And then in verse 7, we see how David even uh, uh, rebuked his men and kept them from uh, rising against Saul. But then notice verse 8. David also arose afterward after Saul and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. David is showing humility, isn't he? David then tells Saul how he spared his life. In verse 11, David says, There is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and have not sinned against thee, yet thou hunt my soul to take it. Verse 12, Jehovah, judge between me and thee, and Jehovah, avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. You see how David is trusting in the Lord to vindicate him? And therefore, he's patient in divine providence. But this is what I want you to see, verse 14. As you look at verse 14, notice how David views himself. What does David call himself in verse 14? A dead dog and a flea. David is saying to Saul, why do you want to kill me? Who am I? I'm just a dead dog. I'm a flea. Saul, pursue God's kingdom. Glorify God, why are you after me? Who am I but an unworthy man? A dog, a dead dog at that, and a flea. Now this is, this is not false humility. This is actually true humility. This is the confession of a Christian, right? Let me give you four examples from other places in the Bible about how God's people True, humble believers view themselves. Job, after he was confronted with the holiness of God, says in Job 42, verse 6, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord, Jehovah of hosts. As Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne, what is Isaiah's response? Ooh, I'm going to write a book about how I've been to heaven and sell copies. No, no. What does Isaiah say? Woe is me. Isaiah is expecting immediate destruction because he knows he's a sinner and he's in the presence of a holy God. How about Luke 5 and verse 8 where Peter says to Jesus, listen to this, 
After Jesus performs the miracle of the great uh, catch of the fish, here's what Peter says. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And finally, the apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, listen, of whom I am chief. Paul viewed himself as the chief of sinners, right? You might say, but David, you're, push, you're exaggerating. A dead dog and a flea? Come on, David, have some self-confidence. No, no. Here's the thing. David had God confidence. David saw himself in the true light. The problem is this. As long as I compare myself with other people, like if David compared himself with Saul, David would see himself as better, obviously. If I compared myself with Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler, boy, I am first in line to heaven. But here's the problem. The standard is not other people because we can always find other people that are worse than us. The standard is the law of God. And when I see myself in the mirror of God's law, when I'm confronted with the holiness and the perfection of God, I see myself in the true light. I see my spiritual bankruptcy and my need for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can save me from my sin and misery. David and all of us here, listen, are no better than a dead dog and a flea. We are beggars. And we are in need of the grace of God. Because apart from God's grace, we would remain under the wrath of God. But the good news of the gospel is that Christ died for the ungodly. All those who repent and believe in the gospel will receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And we are saints. We are righteous. But that righteousness is not ours. That's the righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to us, and we receive it by faith alone. Listen, children, what pleases God is humility. What pleases God is sorrow over sins and trust in Christ alone for your salvation. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. True humility and godly sorrow lead to repentance. And this brings us to our fourth exhortation for waiting well. Our fourth heading. Have godly sorrow and repentance. Have godly sorrow and repentance. This is the fourth encouragement for you to wait well. Make sure as you live your Christian life, you have godly sorrow and repentance because the entirety of the Christian life, listen, is a life of repentance. The entirety of the Christian life. If your testimony is, 20 years ago, I prayed the prayer and I repented and that was the last time that I repented, you don't understand the grace of God because you sin every day and so do I. And I need God's forgiveness and his grace every day. God calls us to repent every day and believe every day in Christ and depend on him. Psalm 51 says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are, God are what? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. True, God, true sorrow, God, uh, godly sorrow and repentance. Where do I get that from the text? Let me show you. In verses 16 through 21, we see how Saul responds with sorrow, doesn't he? I mean, he's really sorry. He kind of feels bad for David. And he understands how David did spare his life. I mean, David could have killed him, but he didn't. And so Saul appreciates that. And he is sorrowful. In fact, verse 16 says, look at it, the end of verse 16. And Saul lifted up his voice and what? Wept, right? Saul even weeps with sorrow. But here's the question. Is this godly sorrow? Because there is also a worldly kind of sorrow, isn't there? 
Saul's reaction is not of godly sorrow, but of worldly sorrow. You know how I know that? The very next chapter, he's going to try to take David's life again. Saul feels sorry for a short time, temporarily, and then soon returns to his wicked ways and folly. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. It's not enough to have sorrow. You want to make sure you have godly sorrow and not worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow over sin leads to repentance, which is a turning away from sin unto Christ by faith in him. But Saul's repentance here is a false repentance, a worldly repentance, like the repentance of Judas Iscariot. What do we learn from this as Christians? We need to repent of our sins and believe in Christ every day. This is how we wait patiently upon the Lord. Now watch this. If you're too busy thinking about other people's sins, that's not going to encourage you to repent because you're thinking about how other people should repent. But what about you? If you think about how other people have wronged you and that's all you're thinking about, you will not see how horrible your own sins are and how much you need the mercy of God, right? When I think about other people's sins and how annoying they are and how unfaithful they are, I feel frustrated, I feel upset, but then I remember, oh wait, I'm annoying. I am the problem. I am a sinner. And as I look at God's majesty and his holiness, I see the horror, watch, of my own sins. And that helps me to be patient with other people that have wronged me. Because God was patient to me. He showed me mercy. How can I not extend that mercy to other people? And this is our final heading, a short heading. The fifth encouragement, the fifth exhortation to wait well, to be patient in providence is this. Extend mercy to others. Extend mercy to others. Look at verse 22. So in verse 21, uh, Saul says, David, swear now, therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house, right? So Saul says, David, I know you're going to be king. I know that. Please don't destroy my name. Don't destroy my seed after me, my children. Because of me, don't destroy my children, right? Right? Now, notice how David responds in verse 22. How long does it take David to say, okay, right away? Right away, David says, yes. Yes, I will preserve your children. I will not treat them according to your sins. And I will not treat you the way you deserve. David shows mercy, doesn't he? David shows mercy to Saul. Verse 22 says, and David swear unto Saul. How quick David was to extend mercy to his enemy. David treated Saul with compassion. You know what Ephesians 4 verse 32 says? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ouch, that's hard. That's a hard verse, isn't it? Forgive others knowing that God, for the sake of Christ, has forgiven you. Brothers and sisters, you can forgive others. You can extend mercy to them because God has forgiven you for Christ's sake. Therefore, be patient in the Lord. Trust him and don't treat people the way they deserve because remember, every day God treats you the way you don't deserve. 
Well, I trust with these exhortations from God's word that we are encouraged to be patient in suffering, knowing that glory is coming. Be patient in the Lord. Wait upon him. He will sustain you. He will hold you fast. Follow Christ, David's son and David's Lord, who suffered for us, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. You also commit yourselves to the one who is the righteous judge. Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Christians, Adults, children, Christ is the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. And in him you are safe. And there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, be patient and rest in him. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. You know that verse, right? And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait upon the Lord and look to Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this encouragement from your word. We thank you, Lord, For our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who remained faithful to the end, who went to the cross before he got to the crown. He suffered and humbled himself before he was exalted. And Father, we thank you for the promise that you have given us, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us one day. Help us to live in light of the second coming of Christ. Help us to endure with patience, with long suffering. Help us to endure by faith in Jesus Christ and rest in your sweet promises. Father, we do pray this morning for those in our families among our relatives who are not believers. We pray that you would draw them to yourself. We pray that they would also see their spiritual bankruptcy like David did, apart from the grace of God, and that they would cast themselves at the mercy of Jesus. Oh, Father, save our loved ones. Draw them to yourself. And we pray for our children We are thankful for them. We pray that you would continue to bless them and establish them in the gospel. We pray that our children would have humility, that our children would boast upon Christ alone, that they would glory in the cross, and they would rest in Christ alone for their salvation. Bless all our children. May they be yours forever. May they confess Jesus before Lord, uh, confess Jesus as Lord before men and help us all to long for that day when Christ will confess us before the world help us to look to him the author and the finisher of our faith for we ask this in Jesus name who taught us to pray saying our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.